good afternoon. Uh, my name is Elisa Kaplan, president of the Jewish Historical Society. I, I now know everybody. Um, and so I bring you greetings from the society. And we are the home for Jewish memories. We tell the Jewish story in Fairfield County and beyond. And we're gonna be helping you eventually tell your own story. So stay tuned for that. Um, our book talks are underwritten by Marcy Schoenfeld in honor of her beloved parents, Rose and Abraham Schoenfeld and Eileen Belinsky and Susan Trotz in memory of their beloved parents, Eleanor and Nathan Belinsky. Our, present today, our presentation today is very timely because next week, the title of the book is The Book of V. And next week is the holiday of Purim, which we're all gonna get dressed up for. So I encourage you to wear costumes. So your, but your mission, should you choose to um, accept it, is to wear a mask. And, oh, wait a minute, we're already wearing masks. Okay, so we're in, in, in line for Purim already. And Purim is a very <laughs> holiday. Um, the villain of Purim, Haman. Oh, that's upside down. Uh, is so reviled that whenever he's mentioned, we stomp our feet, we yell, or, or we use a grogger. So, and people eat hat-shaped cookies. So the traditional Purim treat is humantashen, which means Haman's pockets. Um, but in Hebrew, they're ozne haman, they're Haman's ears. Do you wanna eat Haman's ears? Oh my. Um, and the book of Esther is unique. Uh, it's the only book of the Hebrew Bible that doesn't mention God. So it's, but Rhonda's going to tell us some, a lot of other things about um, the book of Esther and the character of Esther. And, and you'll think about Purim, which is happening next week. And you can find the, the original book of Esther in the Bible. You may not have gotten to it yet because it's all the way near the end, but it is there in case you want to see it. Okay, so we are so fortunate today to have a very talented educator, Rhonda Ginsberg, Mora Rhonda, teacher Rhonda, to share the novel, The Book of V. Uh, Rhonda was born on Long Island and grew up there in Valley Stream. I don't know if you know that, um, that town or not, but maybe you do. Okay, Rhonda went to SUNY Binghamton and, and graduated with a degree in math and computer science, and she continued her education at NYU studying IT, which is why we have Rhonda working on computers for us. In fact, Rhonda worked for 30 years in the IT field, of course, starting at age six. Uh, well, we won her over to education eventually, and Rhonda got a master's in education from the University of Bridgeport. And she put those skills to very good use as a teacher at Carmel Academy. And um, she was there for 15 years where she ran the uh, award-winning science department. She and Larry, her husband, moved to Stanford in 1979. And the rest, Rhonda, is history. So Rhonda, make some noise for Pura. And take it away, Rhonda. Okay, thank you, Elisa. Okay, it's great to be here, and we are doing the book of V. So we are going to look at the book of V, and obviously it's backwards looking at it here, but it is a very interesting book, and I'm going to share my presentation and talk about it as we go. So, The Book of V, a novel by Anna Solomon. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the author first. She was born and raised in Glasser, Massachusetts. She now lives in Brooklyn with her husband and two children. You're going to see some parallels there with one of her characters. And a little bit about her. You know, she's graduate of Brown University. She teaches writing. And she has written three novels and a lot of short stories. She's won a lot of awards. And 
is an excellent speaker, depending upon the timing. I might show a little bit of one of her interviews, so we'll see how it goes time-wise. So, the book. The book is both modern and, I say historical fiction, it's debatable how much of it is actual historical, how much of it is pure fantasy of uh, the Book of Esther. But it's three intertwined stories, and there are three to four main heroines. Lily Rubenstein is a modern wife and mother living in Brooklyn in current times. The book takes place a few years ago. And we have Vivian or V. Barr Kent, a senator's wife. We first encounter in the early 1970s in the Watergate era in Washington, D.C. And we see a little bit of her as a senator's wife living in Washington, D.C. as we start to encounter Vivian. And we have Esther, an orphan girl living with her aunt and uncle's family outside the palace walls in Susa, Persia, in about the 460s BCE. As part of Esther's story, we get introduced to Vashti, and she becomes an important character late in the book. And the book is divided into exile, wandering, and reinvention, with each of the characters going through phases of her life. So we're going to learn a little bit more about each of the main characters. Lily's a modern wife married to Adam. She has two daughters, Rosie and June, basically kindergarten and preschool age. She lives in an apartment in Brooklyn, and she gave up her academic career to be a full-time housewife and mother because it's too expensive to get a part-time teaching job in the area. Child care is more than what she would earn. And Adam works for a nonprofit dealing with poverty in Africa, which is part of the story as we go along. And Lily is a second wife, just like Esther in the story. Adam's first wife, Vera, we're gonna again see a lot of these in here um, in the book. Her mother is Ruth, now living in Brooklyn, but originally from Gloucester, Massachusetts, which was the hometown of the author. It's unclear how Jewish Lily is since her mother converted to Judaism when Lily was a young child. Doesn't say whether the children converted or not. Her father was Jewish, but uh, not religious at all. And he divorced the mother uh, and the parents divorced when Lily was a child. And he's been deceased for quite a while. So Lily had some Judaism, but not much in her life. So her life revolves around her family and her apartment. Her concerns are getting the children to and from school, remembering her laundry and learning how to sew dresses for her daughters for Purim. So there's a lot about Lily trying to get her life going and she keeps forgetting the laundry. She keeps have, being late to school and getting uh, fined for it and all kinds of issues that, you know, she's, Overeducated, understimulated, very dissatisfied with her life. She has conversations about that with her mother because her father was also very dissatisfied with life. And mother says, like father, like daughter, you know, she just can't get her life going. So uh, a lot of the story, the events happened to her rather than her making things happen. So the biggest challenge for her is her mother's diagnosis with cancer illness and death in a fairly short period of time. And Lily is the only daughter. She has two older brothers. So she ends up as the main caregiver and organizer. And it's only after her mother's illness and basically as she's dying that Lily finds out a lot about her mother's early life. And you get a lot of mother-daughter interactions going on and we have the same thing with the other characters who are orphans by that point and their thoughts about their parents also comes up a lot, especially interactions with their mothers. So then we have V. V or Vivian Barr is, we start the story, she's a senator's wife living in Watergate era, Washington, DC. She comes from a very powerful, wealthy political family her parents and her grandparents are deceased, but her father was a senator, her grandfather was a governor, 
all up in New England in various uh, states. And her husband was appointed a senator from Rhode Island. His power, the townhouse, the money all comes through V. So he's up and coming, but it's on uh, V. Early in the story, there is a party and husband Alex decides to have a separate party for the men in one room and the women in another room. And there is a wealthy donor who is there at the party with his wife and turns out the wife and these husband dated at one point and apparently there was either a date rape incident or something that wasn't very nice. And the donor to try, uh, says to keep his support, he wants V to do something. He wants V to come and dance naked at the men's part of the party. You can obviously see the uh, relation to Vashti and the Purim story. V, not sure what to do, what should she do? She ends up fleeing uh, the party and the advisor basically to her husband tells her she is now banished. So here she had the power, she had the money, but she is the one who has to flee rather than you know the husband, the donor, you know, what she was asked was not very nice, but she's the one who ends up going. So V escapes to a friend Rosemary's house in Gloucester, Massachusetts, where she used to spend hot summers. Rosemary lives there with her husband and her three children. And uh, V is there with them, but V introduces Rosemary to drinking bourbon, to smoking. She has an affair while she's there. Rosemary is pregnant. And whether the bourbon and the smoking had anything to do with it, we don't know, but she miscarries the child. And after the miscarriage, Rosemary and her husband asked V to leave. Not very nicely the way they asked. V lives with some other people, and eventually becomes a writer in Gramercy Park area of New York City in the early 1970s. Over time, she decides not to marry or have a family, living as a single woman at a time when it was just starting to become acceptable. And something I found interesting was I lived in Gramercy Park area in the early 1970s as single and then married uh, later in the 1970s and had some of the similar experiences to be as a working woman in New York City. So her life was very relatable at that point in it because it was a lot of what I was experiencing of New York at that time and being a career woman at a time when it wasn't all that usual for women to have careers on their own. Then we have Esther, probably the story most of you are most familiar with, but it's turned a little differently here. Esther or Hadassah in Hebrew is the Esther from the Purim story living in Susa around 460 BCE. So her parents both die when she's a child and she moves in with her aunt and uncle. And it's very clear here that it's the aunt and uncle and she's brought into the family as basically a helper uh, because this is her only family. And they are living with a collection of Jews in an impoverished tent community outside the walls of the palace. The camp is being harassed by Persian thugs Due to an incident, her male cousin, the oldest of her aunt and uncle's children, by accident, um, basically uh, stole something. Uh, he thought he was using real coins and wasn't, and they used that as an excuse to harass the community, and the harassment gets worse and worse. As Esther reaches womanhood, which is where we see her in the story, her uncle becomes infatuated with her and he realizes he needs to marry her off, but there's no money for a dowry for the man she is in love with. So Marduk, which is how he's called in this story, uses the excuse of the king looking for a new bride. We have the same Vashti story, but it's basically just background here to get rid of Esther into the palace. And at the same time, he has to bring his figs in. He wants to get the king to love his figs and hopefully use that as a way to stop the attack. 
crazy scheme, low chance of success. Uh, success. We have Esther in the night station where she is with the other women who are brought, the other maidens who are brought in to the palace. Uh, basically, they realize this is all poor girls from various towns because rich uh, families are not sending their daughters off to be concubines in the uh, palace with very little chance of marrying the king. But Esther ends up, when, and when they're paraded, at being the only one without makeup, and the king sees her as different and ends up marrying her, you know, as we know. So Esther really did not want this at all. She was hoping to be able to get out of the palace. So she ends up, she's from a magical family, and she uses her power to discourage the king, first by transforming into a beast, Later, she tries to use her power to give a bird life again to try and deliver a message to get the Jews to leave the area because the attacks are getting worse and worse. She has a son with the king, who is now the king's heir, but she is a prisoner in the palace tied to the king, who is controlled by the minister. The king is very weak, and the minister is the one with the power, and she's controlled by him, and there are a number of incidents with this minister. She tries to lose her power to get her people to leave. In the end, they do leave, but not in the way of the Purim story. It's through Basti and her story. She lives in here, but I'll leave you to see how. So the time periods, we have three. We have ancient when women had no power. This was women's fate until very recent times really could be any time period until the early 20th century. It uses the Esther story, but is symbolic of women having no power, women going from their parents' house to their husbands without having any real power of their own, even if you did come from a wealthy family. The 1970s, it's the time of Roe v. Wade. It's the time of contraceptives. Women are starting to get control and power of their body. Women had more financial freedom, career choices, the women's movement. We're starting to see a time where we think women can have it all. And then we have modern times. Women have freedom of choices, but still not happy, not necessarily taking advantage. Can you really have it all? So those are the three main time periods in the book. So the essential questions. What does the book tell us about the choices women have? or have had through the generations? Have those choices changes, changed? Are they the same? Are too many choices as bad as no choices? What does it tell us about the Purim story? What was Vashti's error? Was there an error? Should she have been put in this position? Why is Esther considered the heroine rather than Vashti? You know, what did she do that was bit wrong? What does the book offer us? Why read the book? And I would definitely say you should read the book. I loved it. I've read it three times now. So it's an interesting book. And you get more nuances each time you read the book. Now, I read it the first time last summer and have read it a couple of times since as I've prepared for this. So major themes of the book. First one is power. We're looking at women's lives and choices or lack thereof. Do they have their own power? was given to them by men in their lives, how they gain or lose power through marriage and death. So Esther's story, again, thinking about in the night station, another old story. They have to despise and depend on each other. Only poor girls were sent to be choices for the king. Rich families understood the king was not looking for nobility, but a girl to use and abuse. Night station is not a brutal prison or a luxurious bathhouse, but something in the middle. And Lily and Adam have been discussing her going back to work, a job that paid nearly as much as Adam was making then, but in Iowa. Then she turns it down because she doesn't want to disrupt Adam's career. So Vivian gives up her power to her husband to live the life of a senator's wife, but she pays the price because she is now powerless because he has taken her power, just as Vashti does. It's interesting that the men they see power to 
are weak men in the book and ruled by their advisors who take the power that started as the wife's power. And Vivian about living in New York City. The more she knew, the more she liked being alone. What she liked, she realized, was to know there were people out there available should she want to see someone. Usually she chose to remain alone. Now she was living in a way that guaranteed no one would ever throw her out again. I've been thinking about it, she says, and I think I really did not want the men so much I wanted to be the man. So she saw in the 70s, 80s, 90s that the men had the power at that point and she wanted to be a man to have the power. And she lives as what we thought of almost as men, as a single woman. And uh, Vashti in the desert, she is herself, she is someone new. She's going out from Susa. So again, she is now taking the power and making the choices and not living under a man's rule. So they change through the years, but girls have had to depend on men for sustenance, subsistence for many years. Only recently have women been able to work and financially take care of themselves. How many actually have that opportunity or that choice? As we look around the world, we see we are very lucky here. Most women in the world do not have that opportunity even as we speak now. Another major theme is identity. How do women see themselves? How do they re relate to their mothers, their sisters, their girlfriends? Most women spend their lives thinking about who they are and how they relate to those around them. We have more choices, are we using them wisely for fulfilling lives? We're always comparing ourselves to other women, clothes, homes, children, spouses. We dress for other women rather than ourselves or men. Costumes is a theme in the story. We see the pageants in Balsusa and in the Brooklyn Porum story. So where our costumes tell us who we are or who we want to be. And again, sewing is a big uh, part of the story and Lily learning to sew and having no knowledge that her mother used to sew because her mother gave up sewing. And she goes to a woman in Brooklyn to learn how to uh, sew. She's envious of Kyla, a Gentile woman and her friends. She disdains them, but she in some ways wants to be like them sexuality, how norms have changed or not. Women are still ruled by their bodies, by child rearing, and often by men and how other women view them. And one of the things Ruth says to Lily is, there's no shame in Vasti, Lily. Didn't I teach you that? And through the story, sex is almost another character. We have a lot of affairs going on in the story, both V and Lily's father. It's a weapon, Adam, uh, V's husband uses it as a weapon on her a number of times in the story. We have a number of incidents of date rape in the story. So it's again used as a way to control women by men. And women see how women see themselves. Women, uh, self-assessment is always an issue with women. Women are starting to uh, look at uh, other women, are they friends, are they adversaries? How do we reach across to women who are not like ourselves? Another one, uh, theme is the parallels of Vashti's story and Vivian's. Both had the power through their families and money until marriage. Now this was the author's invention on Vashti that her family was the one who had the power. Her father was the king that Asha Beres was an advisor to the king. And when the king has an untimely death with only a daughter, that uh, Vashti is married to Asha Beres and he becomes the king and he steals the power, but he's a weak king and his advisor actually is the one who takes over the power. And women could not assume power in their own right back in the time of the Purim story and even in 1970s Washington, we were just starting to see some women politicians, but relatively few at that point in time. And Vashti has brave disobedience, but of course to her power and possibly her life. 
And Vivian is trying to figure out what she should have done. Should she have stripped, slapped her husband, made a speech? She thinks back to a number of times when she was abused and he'd missed the point, of course. How could she possibly go back? She had been debased in her own home, put to a test. She would have to be flourished to willfully pass, then treated like a whore for failing it. Same as Vashti. So this is these thoughts as Adam wants her back, and she decides she could never go back to Washington under those circumstances. So she thinks about uh, all the trouble and what, what did she do wrong? And again, it's looking at uh, Vashti and the same basic story. Another theme is the parallels of Esther's and Lily's lives. Both the second wives married for children and family. Both are compared to the first wives who the husbands mess after they're gone. Neither first wife had children. Both were more capable, more independent. Lily has a very nice apartment, but she's never satisfied. She put her career on hold, but she still always has a problem and not sure how to be happy. And Lily thinks not until this moment in Kyla's kitchen, as she's talking about how she met her husband, does she realize the parallels to Esther's story because she met Adam at a friend's party where there were several single women invited after Adam's divorce for him to meet. And Adam talks to a number of people, at the, a number of the women at the party, doesn't really talk to Lily at all until at the very end when Lily is the only one of the single women there who puts on a plain hat to go out into a bitter cold Brooklyn night and uh, Adam looks at her as being someone who is, you know, capable and thinking about herself rather than beauty. And that's when he becomes attracted to her. So similar to the Esther story where the king chooses the only woman who is not wearing makeup and everything. She's a second wife. She stays a second wife. And whether Adam is always comparing her to the first wife or not, Lily is always comparing herself to the first wife. And another theme is Jews in the diaspora. How do you keep your identity as a minority? In Persia, the Jews are persecuted. The mob is attacking them. It's legally sanctioned by the king and advisors. It's a little bit easier to keep your identity when you are separate. You know, it's harder for Esther as she goes into the palace to keep her identity. Rosemary marries a Jewish man and moves to her hometown in New England, which is restricted. She finds a cross burning on the lawn. Her husband is not very religious, but he is still kept separate from many of the residents. He's an attorney, but most of the long-term residents will not hire him. He tends to take the clients who are more disenfranchised. And Lily at Kyla's party, she feels different from the other mothers there. Is it discrimination? Is it because she's Jewish? Is it, you know, what is it? She's cultural. She's not especially knowledgeable or religious. She learns more about her mother's Jewish life at the memorial service for her mother than she knew during her mother's life. So her mother didn't include her in that part of her life. Men are secondary characters in the story. They're not seen as strong or fully developed. They take the power from the women and use that power to keep women down. And in each case, the men are very often controlled by an advisor. The bee's husband needs the support of donors and his aid. Rosemary's husband has affairs. Lily's husband is stronger, but needs the expertise of another father who Lily almost has an affair with, but doesn't to get a promotion. Esther thinks of her uncle, who wasn't smarter than her aunt. He was just in charge. And she used to be above him, uh, Vashti thinks. Uh, she was the one with the, oh, this is V thinks. She was the one with the money, with the background. Then he flipped it inside out. He doesn't need her background anymore. He is in the house they bought with her money. Even if she goes back, she will have been a nutty, drug-addicted, probable lesbian. But to have made him a cuckold, it would be something. But then, well, she had not gone along. 
whites had the power and the wealth and the advisors took it and then banished them. Vashti thinks, who was he? A former steward to make the rules. He was not a natural king like a father and grandfather. He was suggestible. She had the power and he knew it, but he took that power. And you know, there are a number of others are thinking about what the choices were and should they make those choices. So again, looking at our essential question, what does the book tell us about the choices women have had? You can see they've had those choices. Have the choices really changed all that much in a couple of thousand years? Really not all that much. And as we see in Lily's case, too many choices can be as bad as no choices. We learned about the Purim story. What was Vashti's error? Was there an error? Should she have been put in that position? Of course not. And why is Esther considered the heroine? In this particular story, she is really not looked at too much as the heroine. And the book tells us and shows us a lot about women. Why read the book? It's an interesting story. It's interesting and very thought provoking. And a couple of questions from an author's interview. Uh, why is Esther given supernatural powers? She wanted it to be playful and magical, explore women's power, exploring uh, Jewish magical belief like the golem. Why is it called the Book of V? It belongs to Lily as a second wife with that first wife, Vera, in the background. Vivian or V is one of the main characters and in big part to bring Vashti out of the shadows. Why are costumes emphasized? Costumes play a big part Women define themselves by how they dress and wear makeup. Humming, drinking, sewing, the making of costumes resonate through all the characters. How are male expectations changing? Why are they minor characters? Haman is not named like women are so often in Bible or history. Ashabarish is the king led by a minister, not a strong male leader. And in conclusion, the story of Purim, what Vashti thinks this exile people needs is forming in her mind. She'll tell it tonight, making Esther and Marduk the heroes. The story doesn't have to be believable, she realizes. It has to be the opposite. So unbelievable, they can believe in it. So far from what they know to be true that they can lose sight of the truth. Rivers of wine, harlots, a pageant, a parade, spies and riots, and then a party. The story that will become the book, hurt with nothing but laughter. And at the very end of the book, Lily thinking of her daughters. The type of woman you imagine yourself becoming does not exist. But who does but who does know? If Lily had been waiting for some kind of transformation, she understands now that none is coming. No new Lily, only herself moving forward. What do you gain and lose by the choices you make? Throughout most of history, women went from their father's houses to their husbands with no control of their bodies, finances, or even their life. In the end, as women, we are lucky to live in a time when we do have choices, but we need to make the most of these choices, do something fulfilling and worthwhile in this world. Okay, so questions and answers. You have questions, now's the time. I hope if you haven't read the book, you will read the book because it is really a wonderful story, as I said. So if you have questions, please unmute yourself and ask. To unmute myself. Judy, unmute yourself. Okay. All right, Rhonda, thank you so much. I read the book too, and I was really, I, some of it eluded me. <laughs> But um, a question, um, at the end, they, they kind of, uh, I was wondering, is, is um, Ruth the? No, I won't tell you who Ruth is because I don't want to spoil it for the people who have it. I will do it uh, privately to you, Judy, afterwards, okay. but I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't read. Okay. You know, um, interestingly enough, I just wrote a um, uh, common contact article on Le uh, Leonora Helmsley, 
one of her quotes was that I wanted to be the biggest real estate man in the world. Huh. It's something that, you know, it's, I saw this because I worked in the IT field and I worked basically in a man's field. I was one of the first women managers in reinsurance and everything. When I worked for that company, I was in a division where it was 40 male managers and me. And we used to travel around the uh, United States and Canada and it would be me and the entourage. And you know, it was so I could relate to a lot of this, especially Lee's of these life, because you know, it was, you know, at a time where, you know, women were just starting to get that power. So it was very interesting. Any other questions? Comments? You know, those of you who read the book, I hope you enjoyed it. Those of you who didn't, I hope you do read it. Rhonda, I have a question. Yeah. I have I don't really know my history, Jewish history, and the Jews. So I only vaguely remember the book, you know, Esther from when I was, uh, I was Queen Esther in a Purim party. But anyway, um, would I be able to understand it all if I don't have that kind of background? Yes. The first chapter of the book gives you the, uh, basically the briefly, the Purim story done through Lily reading a children's book to her daughters. Okay. So you get the basic story there. In fact, the author in interviews said that she really didn't know the story at, and growing up and everything. She learned it through a children's book that she was given as a gift for her own children. So that's how she learned it. And then to write this book, when she realized what she wanted to do, she went with to a rabbi and got all the sources to learn it. But that was how she learned the basics of the story. So you get enough of the story in there to know and be able to compare. And then I would recommend reading the Megillah if you really want to. It's short. It's 10 short chapters, the Megillah, to get and see how it compares to what the story is. You know, some of the detail. A bit different. Rhonda, mom said she enjoyed this very much. She listened on the phone. And okay, she said, good. And I will read the book. So I will... I, I've read the Megillah, so I know that. I know the story, yeah. but I read the book. Right, and, and you're going to see there are some similarities and some very big differences with the Megillah. Rhonda, who do you think the strongest character is in the, in the book? Gosh. I would have to say V is the strongest character in the book. She really, she takes the most control of her life and lives the most fulfilled life in the book. It's interesting because it doesn't look like it for a lot of the book and then all of a sudden she comes back as a powerhouse. So Rhonda, what's the, uh, which category of women does the um, author fit into? Is she an ancient uh, 1970s or today person? She, age -wise. she really time-wise would fit in Somewhere between V and Lily, based on age, I think she is more capable. She's Lily in being married and having children and all of that, but she is an independent woman working and everything. So her personality is probably closer to V than it is to Lily. So it's, it's interesting because, you know, I've listened to a number of interviews with her and everything. So it's, you know, I... That's how I first got attracted to the book. Hadassah had this uh, book last summer as their one book. So I read it before uh, the Hadassah interview and I've listened to it, our interview a number of times. Through there, I've listened to one from the JCC out in Ohio, I think it is, interviewing her and a number of others. And she's really an interesting author. In fact, I need to read her other books because, you know, I assume I would like her as an author and I have to get the books, you know, just sort of got lost in the, you know, everything else I was doing. But, um, you know, she's a very interesting character and her thought processes in doing this book is interesting. So if we have the time, I might play uh, this if you would like to hear it, uh, her interview. You know, just a couple of minutes of why she did this. 
Um, it looks, I was just looking around the um, table here and the Zoom table and um, er, we all fit into different, if we think of where was I in 1970 in my life, where did I live? Uh, was I, uh, where was I in my education or career or family or, or something else? And um, um, what we have men and women here today. So did I, where was I as a woman or where were the women I knew at the time? Where did they fit in? Um, I think uh, we have a variety of um, experiences around the table. And I do remember that this was a real change point um, in, uh, in American history and in women's history. And it was also the time of bell bottoms and polyester pantsuits. But other than that, um, yeah, it was. And protesting it was, the war in Vietnam, and you know, it, there was a lot going civil on. Civil rights. Civil rights, yeah, a tremendous amount going on at this time. So, this 19, early 70s was a very interesting point uh, to Jews. And you know, as I said, with the Esther story, you know, uh, really it was women's lives, you know, and, you know, you think about in most times in history, a woman who was orphaned, you know, uh, and wasn't married, what happened to her? And, you know, where did she go? You know, uh -huh. I mean, even, you know, for, you know, the Historical Society, when I did the, um, you know, the diary that we have, she went, she was single, she went and lived with her brothers because, you know, she lived for a short time on her own in New York City and then came up to Bridgeport to live with her brothers. But that was the 1920s, woman, right. And that was in the 1920s, you know, that a woman didn't live on her own. Right, right. right. Well, and, and the women's body issues, I know um, the book, Our Bodies, Ourselves, do people know that book? Uh-huh. Yeah came out in, Larry, help me out here, around 1970? Yes, 68? just about. Or a little bit later, yeah, I, I, that was my Bible when I was younger, you know, that I, I still have it, actually. I still have that book. Oh, oh <laughs> open my eyes, that's for sure. And, and, and Miss Magazine came out in 72, so it's really the beginning of the women's movement. Right. I also read the women's room in those years. And I gave it to Dick and he said, I don't like this book. Why did you give this to me? <laughs> this is talking about empowering men to be true partners in a marriage. But he's changed his tune a lot. Right. <laughs> Thanks to some good mentoring. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, what's interesting is that uh, my wife and I met, my wife and I met in college and it was interesting, the perception that, I don't know how all of you feel. I, I, I'm speaking to a lot of women here. But the, perception I, I, the perception that I had was it was a big transition time for women uh, in that women, actually the courses they took and the expectation that they had for their lives was either to be a secretary, they took stenography. And even though my wife was a biology major, uh, she was taking courses in, st in, in, uh, in stenography, becoming a secretary, and an amazing number of years how, and I'm dealing probably here with a bunch of women that went through the same kind of stuff, mm. where you really took on careers that were either that even equivalent to men or more. And, uh, and, and that the whole and it's not that long ago. I mean, it isn't. It, it, it seems like a long time, but it's not that long ago that I think women actually, in the perception only of themselves and what they could achieve, in fact, changed enormously during that period. And uh, so I, 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 it's interesting that the 70s were, in fact, you know, highlighted as a period of time. And there's no question that the women of today are not anywhere close to the women as they perceive themselves to be in the 70s. Just a thought. Well, the, I was gonna say the first, uh, the reform movement okayed the idea for having women rabbis early in the 20th century, but it wasn't until the 1980s, I believe that we had Sally Presand, who became the first woman rabbi. 
Uh, so, and of course we don't have, have not in the United States had a woman president and we do now have a woman vice president, but um, so we've come a long way and there's a long way to go. There's a very long way to go, but it's, yeah, I think about it. It's something I used to tell my students, you know, I taught science and my eighth grade science teacher, no, my seventh grade science teacher, it was the first time I didn't get an A in science and my mother went in to talk to the science teacher, Mr. Messner, and he said to my mother, why are you upset? Do you want her to be a scientist or do you want her to be a wife or mother? Mm. And mother? And the science teacher, if she wants to be both, I want her to have that opportunity. She deserves Good it. Good answer. And I ended up getting A's from there on, and I was math and science all the way and everything. But that was, you know, back in, you know, here it was like mid-60s. That was the perception, and a teacher could say that to everyone. You know, you could say that to a parent at that point. I mean, it was like, so I used to say that, especially to the girls well, in my classes, that that the, was the attitude and that that long ago. And then... To your well, point, let me just point. Interrupt for a second to say, Erica, you want to make your comment out loud? Well, the, the reason I remember when the first female conservative rabbi was ordained in 1985 was because that was the year I was getting married. And my fiance at the time was living in Canada. And I'm all excited because it's on the front page of the New York Times and I'm letting him know about this. And there's just this dead silence on the other end of the phone um, because I did not know that Amy was his former sister-in-law. Uh, ah. <laughs> and marriage had lasted less than a year. Uh, she wanted to go to Paris on the honeymoon and my brother-in-law wanted to go hiking in the Negev. Um, <laughs> they are still incredibly good friends. And uh, my now deceased mother-in-law remained very close to her, but... Uh, she was someone who also got caught in this trap of taking on a profession that had traditionally been for men. And she had a child, uh, was married to another man, and was really forced to live in a very small area um, and had difficulty finding work for many years uh, because she needed to stay within this area because they had joint custody of their child um, and had to give up the pulpit, ended up doing a lot of chaplaincy work for which she is incredibly now renowned. Um, but a lot of those same decisions that we see with a lot of the women in the book and a, a lot of us um, it happened to her. And this was already, you know, would have been the, the 90s already. Um, so it's many of the things changed the same over the centuries or the millennium even. I remember I had friends, uh, this is the late 60s, who were going to get married and they were applying to law school together. Now, she had better LSAT, she had better everything. She got into one school, he got into all eight schools because, mm -hmm. quote, you don't have to worry about Vietnam and you're going to probably just have a baby and not practice. So that was, that was and, they, and it was a time period where they could say that stuff out loud to schools. They weren't ashamed or embarrassed to say those things. Wow, and I think Leslie wanted to join in. Oh. Um, yeah, I'll be quick because I see it's approaching one o'clock. Yeah, just from uh, uh, building on what Rhonda and Peter were saying. So um, it's not just teachers who could have had, you know, kind of biases back in the day. It, it can happen within the family too. Um, so... Um, within my family, and, and I love both of my parents dearly. So this, you know, this is not a reflection on that, but my, my dad um, kept encouraging me to learn how to type and to learn stenography. And, you know, he didn't understand why I wanted to go to college and all of these things, whereas my mother made sure I had a very good education and um, she had, you know, a different vision for, for me. Um, so, you know, even within a family, you can see some, some division and then you have to decide yourself um, what path you want to take and, you know, or if you can possibly, um, you know, manage, manage both. So that, that's really all I wanted to say. 
<laughs> look at so, you. I'm so getting ready good. for forum. It is approaching one o'clock, and we're. I'm happy to stay on for as long as you're here. But if you have other things or need to leave, I want to make sure that we, on behalf of JHSFC, I thank Rhonda uh, for a wonderful presentation this morning about the book of V and that we definitely all are going to, if we haven't read it, we're all going to rush right, right out to read it. And, um, and we, we learned so much and look at the discussion that, that came about because of your excellent presentation. Thank you so much, Rhonda. Fabulous job. If people want to stay on, could we show us some of the interview? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. We'll let um, people, if anyone wants to talk, and then I'll show part of the interview. Okay. Other comments, Liz? I wanted, to, I wanted to add on to what Erica was saying. Um, I have two younger brothers, or I had two younger brothers. Um, and I was told by my father that I couldn't go to a private school because he had to save the money for the boys' education. So... <laughs> within the family is absolutely right. I ended up going to a private school. I went to the first new women's college in, I don't know, 30, 40 years. It was formed in 1968. It was Kirkland College, part of Hamilton College now. And it went defunct 10 years later. Oh. Well, and it went defunct because there was no need to have, they couldn't, they couldn't start by bringing women into Hamilton College at that time. I mean, the, it was the next year that Yale op he opened up to women. Um, so that was kind of an intermediate step, but it does, we were, we, we formed this school, we wrote the rules. I was in the charter class and then disappeared. So it was a very interesting time, both in terms of the women's movement and in terms of, of uh, black lives. So it just, those two coming together at the same time. It's just is very interesting. And the Vietnam War. And the race riots. <laughs> and it's it's a fun time. Right. I spent a lot of time protesting. <laughs> yeah. And Rhonda, I, I also have a math background, so <laughs> yeah. well, I was the only math woman math major my year at Binghamton. So it was I was noticed in classes and I was one of the few. Uh, women in computer science, and that was all in the graduate department at that point. So, if, yeah. yeah, I was quite noticeable in classes. Good for you. I was the first woman to get a, a professional degree in architecture, a master's degree in architecture, in I think about wow. eight years at Oklahoma State University, which had its doors open to everyone. So it was really self-selecting, and and there were probably some bias in the professors, but it was mostly self-selecting. Women didn't. I had to follow my sister. <laughs> <laughs> I was so afraid to be behind her and I had to live up to her. <laughs> Very hard. And we had a junior senior high school, so it was seventh through twelfth grade with the same teachers. So do you they did that because they wanted to exclude the Jews from the main high school in town. So they built these satellite junior senior high schools for the Jewish areas in the town. Wow. So do you want to play a few minutes of the interview? Sure. Yeah, let me let me get it and and we'll listen in. I guess. Yep, let me uh so you talk for a minute. I, I need to just change to what I need to get, exit out of. Okay. Any other stories that people want to tell or comments? Is everybody reading CAST? C-A-S-T-E? It's, it's a big read for the Jewish community. I think it's next week there's a big uh, conversation on the book. It's um, very powerful and very well written. And difficult to, to deal with. Yes, I can't read it for long stretches of Same time. Same thing. Same thing. You know, what's, what, what's interesting is that, uh, uh, Rosalie, I, uh, I, I recently read the book because of my book club. And uh, the, the books that they come up with is fabulous. 
Uh, and I must say that a lot of initial perception of the word caste, obviously, for me anyway, came from India, right? As the mm -hmm. caste system there. But to yeah. realize we have it here was a real, a real eye-opening thing and caused me to see things a lot differently. I thought it was a great book. Yeah. yeah, so we're in the brink of uh, more changes in our culture, in our lifestyle, in our perceptions. And perceptions I hope so. reality. I, I hope so. So if people are considering wanting to read, uh, read a book, this one's a big long one. I'm, really, I'm in the middle of it now. It's called Sapiens. Oh, and I don't know if anyone's read Sapiens, but it, yeah. it is, it is yeah, one, and I read it. Yeah. really fabulous book. And if you want to talk about the history of mankind and, uh, and the, the place we're in now, it, it is, it's mind boggling. There are a few books, there are books that sometimes you read them and you like to take notes because you might forget what it said. So I started taking notes and I was realizing I was writing another book. <laughs> it's very long. An Israeli professor, Bar Ilan, I think. Right, exactly. Or, or, right, that's who, that's who I that think, is. I think, I think that's where he is. Okay, Rhonda, we about ready? Um, able to grasp how it was really, how it was in the very creation of the book really helped me kind of just expand and bring to it my own full sort of imaginative powers. Yeah. So interesting. So it seems to me like a whole book could have just been written on the interplay and everything that we were just talking about there. But you chose a different literary device. You decided to make it much more complicated, interweaving the stories, as you mentioned, of Lily, a contemporary woman in Brooklyn, and Lee, who was a senator's wife in Watergate era, Washington. So that adds a whole other level of complexity. So what was behind your thinking in trying to connect these women in very different times? Yeah, so I, I think that I was I was interested, I've always been interested in storytelling itself and how stories come to be and then in their power to um, both give people at a given time what it is they may need, but then also um, pass on messages to people who later come to that story that may be, you know, how do we relate to them? And in particular, I'm interested in how women relate to the stories that we've been told about ourselves and what our lives might look like. And I was really interested in taking this story and kind of exploring it in that way. And, and the, um, I wanted to see what would happen if I created a Vashti in sort of more contemporary times, which is how I came to Vivian Barr. Um, who plays that out. And I was also really interested basically just in terms of my own, my own life, um, having grown up and kind of been brought up on the heels of the second wave women's movement at a moment that really I think seemed to promise for a lot of us at least, um, you know, that now equality had been gained and there was no longer a need for feminism. And I say this, to, you know, to the point where when I was in college in the 90s at Progressive College, there, you know, when I was studying women's um, movements, it was seen, it was really being taught as women's history, um, not sort of as a present. And um, so I'm interested, and then I came to be, you know, a wife and a mother and to look around me at all the other, these other wife, wives and mothers that I knew or people who had made other choices in their lives not to have children, all these different women who'd made different choices. And all of us seemed to feel that our lives were very different from the ones that we'd been told we would wind up living. Um, and I wanted to explore that. And, and so I think that I saw the, you know, so I took this opportunity to kind of um, look across time in that way and examine how through stories and relationships, women shape um, each other and are, you know, and are in the ways that we perceive ourselves. So I think it's very interesting because these themes of equality and women's desires and needs and power and powerlessness, <laughs> And this whole notion that you say of women's lives, you know, what has changed and what hasn't changed. I mean, clearly a lot has changed, mm -hmm. right? And I, I guess I'm a little older than you, um, but also in that same era of feeling like, you know, everything was possible. There was, you know, if not an absolute end of feminism, we had, we had achieved much. Mm -hmm. And yes, people, you, you know, now are making um, choices. But to me, one of the big issues is really that, that you have these choices, which is what's different from what came before. And I think you explore that to a large extent in the book too, with Lily and with, with me and with other characters as well. So 
I mean, things have changed, right? Oh my gosh, absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, you see that over the course of the book too, or when you think about the three different characters, it's as if the choices for them, and of course we should, I should mention these are, you know, Lily is a woman in Brooklyn who has enough shelter and food. And, you know, like there's a certain amount of need that I, that certainly other women in other parts of the world still very much have. But if we're talking about um, a certain sector, um, so it, just to clarify, I think that, you know, women's choices for someone like Lily, the choices themselves have become in some ways oppressive or the sense that she that, you know, the pressure from different avenues to make different ones while knowing that, but you're free to do anything. But as it turns out, you can't actually, not the phrase has been overused, you can't do it all, but you also can't, um, you know, how is it that she can come to figure out, I guess what I'm trying to say is their choices become more and more internal in a way. You know, I think with Esther, you see that the choice, you know, what she's dealing with is actually around her physical bondage. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of the interview. If you go to the Hadassah website, you can get the entire, or if you search for it, you can get the entire interview. You know, so it's, you know, a full interview. Okay. Okay. So thank so you. Thank you. For joining. For joining. Us. Thank you. Thank for you for inviting Yes. Thanks. Thank thank Later on. Later on. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you, Wanda. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Rock. Rock. Thank you.